guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering sensory, more specifically, audio and visual issues. Guys, if you haven't done so already, please don't forget to like and subscribe below. Don't forget, I'm now also on TikTok and Instagram, and I have audio lessons available on my website. So if you're in the nursing program right now and you're struggling with whatever it is you're learning, check out Nexus Nursing Institute. That's my website. I have audio lessons available. See if whatever you're learning, if I have a lesson on that subject, get that extra tutoring. All right, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. The client's diagnosed with glaucoma. Which symptoms would the nurse expect the client to report? One, halos around lights. Two, floating spots in the vision. Three, a yellow haze around everything. Or four, a curtain coming across a vision. And guys, the correct answer is one, halos around lights. Um, the question's asking us about glaucoma. What is glaucoma? Remember, glaucoma is increased ocular pressure, right? Increased ocular pressure of the eye. So uh, signs and symptoms is like number one says, it says halos around lights, but also that patient may uh, report um, decreased peripheral vision. They may report blurred vision. Those are signs and symptoms of glaucoma, which is what increased ocular pressure. Now, something very important about glaucoma, we have other questions, so I'm not going to get too deep into this, but you definitely need to know for testing purposes, when a patient has glaucoma, they absolutely need to be taking their glaucoma medications because what these medications do is decrease that ocular pressure. Let me tell you something. If a patient wants to be non-compliant with their drugs, they better be non-compliant with everything but the glaucoma medicine because they're going to mess around and go blind, okay? Glaucoma untreated will end up in blindness, okay? So you have to teach the patient the importance of taking their medication as ordered. Now, let's look at our wrong answer choices too. Floating spots in the vision. We see that with retinal detachment. Three, a yellow haze around everything. We see that in um, uh, digitoxicity. Four, curtain uh, coming across the vision's field. Uh, excuse me, a coming across field of vision. That also we see in retinal detachment, okay? Next question. The client scheduled for right eye cataract removal surgery in five days. Which pre-op instruction should be discussed with the client? One, administer dilating drops in both eyes for 72 hours before surgery. Two, prior to surgery, do not lift any objects heavier than 15 pounds. Three, Make arrangements for being in the hospital for at least three days. Or four, avoid taking any type of medication that causes bleeding, such as aspirin. And guys, the correct answer is four. We talked about this, or I talked to you about this on several occasions. If a patient's having surgery, I don't care what kind of surgery it is, okay? If it's surgery, we're concerned about three things the most. Infection hemorrhage or DVT slash pulmonary embolism. So of course, for the answer, we don't want the patient taking aspirin. Aspirin promotes what? Bleeding. We're already concerned with bleeding, right? So we don't want that patient taking aspirin. So that's the correct answer. Now let's look, look at our wrong answer choices. One, administer dilating drops to both eyes for 72 hours before surgery. Actually guys, the patient's going to uh, be putting those drops in every uh, 10 minutes up to four doses, okay? And they're gonna do that an hour before surgery. So number one is incorrect. They're gonna be putting in those drops every 10 minutes up to four times, up to four doses, and they're gonna do that an hour before surgery. Two, prior to surgery, do not lift any objects heavier than 15 pounds. Not prior to surgery, after surgery. Why? We don't want them doing anything that will increase ocular pressure. So no lifting anything more than 15 pounds, no bending at the waist, no um, try not to cough, try not to sneeze. And if they do have to cough or sneeze, do it with what? The, the mouth open to decrease pressure. We don't want to do anything that will increase ocular pressure. So guys, the correct answer is um, four. Oh, I forgot to go over number three, the choice number three, where it said making arrangements for being in the hospital for at least three days. That's not necessary. These types of procedures are done in the same day surgery center. The patient goes home that same day. The client's post-op retinal detachment surgery and gas tamponade was used to flatten the retina. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? One, teach the signs of increased intraocular pressure. Two, position the client as prescribed by the surgeon. 
Three, assess for signs and symptoms of complication. Or four, explain the importance of follow-up visits. Okay, guys, the correct answer is three. You want to assess for signs and symptoms of complications. Co what are the signs and symptoms of, or what, what are the complications that we're actually looking out for? Increased ocular pressure, which is what we're trying to prevent. Retinal detachment, which we don't want to happen. So you're going to assess that patient for signs and symptoms of complications. All these other choices, choices one, two, and four, all of that stuff can come later, right? But right now, the first thing we want to do is assess the patient. Next question. The 65-year-old client is diagnosed with macular degeneration. Which statement by the nurse indicates the client needs more discharge teaching? One, I should use magnification devices as much as possible. Two, I will look at my ampsular grid at least twice a week. Three, I'm going to use low watt light bulbs in my house. Or four, I'm going to contact a low vision center to evaluate my home. And guys, the correct answer is three. I'm going to use a low watt light bulb in my house. This uh, question is asking which one needs additional teaching. So basically, which one's the wrong answer? And that is the wrong answer. Why are you going to use low, low uh, watts when your vision isn't good? You need high watts. Why? We need things to help the patient increase their vision. So that's why number three is the answer. That's going to need further teaching. All of the other choices are good things to do using magnification devices, um, using that Amsler scale, because the Amsler scale will help the patient identify very quickly if their vision is getting worse. And um, contacting the low vision center to come evaluate the home because it can help the patient know about, you know, um, uh, safety issues in the home. So all of those other choices were good, but the one about using the low, low watts, that's wrong. We want the patient to increase their vision. We want things to help them increase their vision, such as having good lighting, okay? The nurse who's at a local park sees a young man on the ground and realizes he has fallen on a stick and it's lodged in his eye. Which action should the nurse implement at the scene? One, carefully remove the stick from the eye. Two, stabilize the stick as best as possible. Three, flush the eye with water if available. Or four, place the young man in high fowler's position. And guys, the correct answer is to stabilize the stick as best as possible. Now notice that word said stabilize. Did it say pull out? No. Did it say to juggle or move? No. What did it say? Stabilize. Why do we want to stabilize? Let me tell you something. Whenever there's a foreign object in the eye, you always want it to be stabilized. Why? Because if it's moving, it's jerking, it'll cause more damage to the eye. Duh. Right? So that's the most important thing you want to do. You want to stabilize it. Now, I want to point something out to you. One, carefully remove the stick from the eye. Oh my gosh. You don't do that. That's like a patient that had a stab wound, right? And you pull out that knife. You pull it. That knife being lodged in their in, in, in their chest, maybe that plug is keeping the patient from hemorrhaging out. So not only are you causing more trauma and damage when you pull it out, you can cause that patient to hemorrhage, right? So you don't pull it out. You never pull out a foreign object. You want to stabilize it. So that's wrong. Choice three, flush the uh, eye with water if available. This would have been a perfect answer if the question was asking us about... Um, chemical about a chemical injury chemicals got in the patient's eye chemical gets the patient's eye the first thing you want to do is flush your what what eye out with water flush 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 and why that while that eye is being flushed you're going to call for help call 911 but the first thing you want to do is flush the eye because what's the point of finding a phone to call 911 while whatever is harming the eye is still in the eye the first thing you want to do is flush the eye that's for chemical injuries to the eye okay not for an object's and the last choice place a um, young man in high fowlers. That high fowlers position, that can cause increased ocular pressure, number one. And number two, that's not going to be a priority anyway. Priority is what? Stabilizing that foreign object. We want to decrease the damage to the eye as much as possible. The employee health nurse is teaching a class on preventing eye injury. Which information should be discussed with the class? One, read instructions thoroughly before using tools and chemicals. Two, wear some types of glasses when working around flying fragments. Three, always wear a protective helmet with eye shield around dust part particles. Or four, pay close attention to the surroundings so that eye injuries will be prevented. 
Okay, guys, and the correct answer is number one. Why? Number one is an umbrella answer. Um, what does an umbrella do? An umbrella covers you, right? It protects you from the rain, it covers you. Well, umbrella answers are answers that cover other correct answers, right? So guess what? I want you to think about it this way. Choices two, three, and four, how would you know to do those things? By reading the instructions. That's why it's so important. When you read the instructions, you're gonna know what to do and what not to do. So that's why number one is the correct answer. The 65-year-old male client who is complaining of blurred vision reports that he thinks his glasses need to be cleaned all the time. He denies any type of pain in his eyes. Based on these signs and symptoms, which eye disorder would the nurse suspect the client has? One, corneal dystrophy. Two, conjunctivitis. Three, diabetic retinopathy. Or four, cataracts. Okay, guys, and the correct... Um, the correct answer for this is cataracts, number four. What is cataracts? Cataracts is cloudiness of the lens. Why do you think that patient feels like they have to be uh, cleaning out their glasses all the time? It's not their glasses that's the problem, it's their actual lens that's getting cloudy, right? Cloudiness of the lens. And there was another hint in the question to make us know that it was cataract and that's something else. The 65 years of age, okay, who do we see cataracts in? The elderly clients. As they age, those lens start to get uh, um, cloudy and they, the cloudiness needs to be surgi surgically removed. So the age and plus the other hint about the patient saying they have to wipe those glasses all the time. That should have left you, um, led you to cataracts. Now let's look at our other answer choices. One, corneal dystrophy. This is something we see um, patients with um, corneal dystrophy, we tend to see this diagnosed like when they're around their 20s. And with corneal dystrophy, we're going to see decreased vision, but also blisters, okay? And this patient's 65, so we wouldn't suspect corneal dystrophy. Two, conjunctivitis. That's infection inflammation of the conjunctiva, right? That the patient may have pain. They have may have redness of the eye, but... Not that they, you know, feel they have to keep um, um, wiping their glasses. So that's not it. Uh, diabetic retinopathy. What's diabetic retinopathy? That's when those tiny, tiny, tiny little blood vessels st start to break down due to the diabetes. Remember, those blood vessels is what's carrying oxygen, vitamins, nutrients, minerals to the eye. So if, so if they're not... Um, able to bring those oxygen, vitamins, minerals to the eye because they're breaking down, what's going to happen? Eventually blindness. Yeah. So the correct answer, guys, is cataracts, which is cloudiness of the lens. The nurse is administering eye drops to the client. Which guidelines should the nurse adhere to when instilling the drops into one eye? Select all that applies. Now, guys, by now, you know how we treat, treat select all that applies is what? True or false. All right, let's get into it. Number one, do not touch the tip of the medication container to the eye. Absolutely true. We're going to keep that. Why? The reason we don't want the tip of that medication um, come into contact with the eye, number one, contamination. All right? Whatever kind of infection you have in the eye, that bacteria is now at the tip of that medication, right? And that's the same medication you're going to keep putting in your same eye. You think that eye is going to get better? Absolutely not. So we're worried about you know, infection, contamination, and we're also worried about injury. What if the tip of that medication causes um, corneal um, ulcers, ulceration of the cornea, right? You scratch that eye. Absolutely not. So true. One is good. Two, apply gentle pressure on the outer canthus of the eye. Why? You need to apply gentle pressure where? On the inner canthus of the eye. So that's false. We're not going to keep that. Three, apply sterile gloves prior to instilling eye drops. No, this is a sterile procedure. You're going to apply clean gloves, right? You're going to wash your hands, apply clean gloves. You're going to put the eye drops, take the gloves off, and wash your hands again. Remember, you're always going to wear gloves whenever there's a chance of you coming into contact with body fluids, whether it's um, tears, saliva, urine, feces, vomitus, I don't care. If it's wet, you're going to put on gloves. Number four, hold the lower lid down and instill the, drop, instill the drops into the conjunctiva. 
absolutely. You want to instill the drops right here into the conjunctiva, never directly onto the eye because here in the conjunctiva, you have all of these blood vessels and this is where the blood's gonna be absorbed, okay? Not directly on the eye. So that's true, we're gonna keep that. Number five, gently pat the skin to absorb excess eye drops that run into the cheek. Why? We don't want that medication being absorbed on the skin and the cheek. We want that medication being absorbed where? In the eye. So that's false. So the correct answer is number one and number four. Which statement by the client would indicate, would indicate that the client is experiencing some type of hearing loss? One, I clean my ears every day after I take a shower. Two, I keep, I keep turning up the sound on my television. Three, my ears hurt, especially when I yawn. Or four, I get dizzy when I get up from the chair. And guys, when we're talking about hearing loss, the answer is going to be two. I keep turning up the sound on my television. Why is the patient turning up the sound? Because they can't hear, right? So that's the correct answer. All the other choices are incorrect. Next question. Which factors increase the client's risk of developing hearing loss? Select all that applies. How do we treat select all that applies? As true or false. Let's go. One, perforation of the tympanic membrane. Absolutely. Of course, perforation of that eardrum that can cause hearing loss. Absolutely, we're gonna keep that. Two, chronic exposure to loud noises. Absolute, matter of fact, let me tell you guys a story very quickly, a very good friend of mine. Uh, we went to college together and he ended up losing hearing um, in both of his ears, but one worse than the other. And what happened was just one night, one night he went to the club and he was partying right next to one of the speakers and it completely just blew out his eardrum. Okay. So if that can happen with just one time, absolutely chronic exposure to loud noises can cause hearing loss. You better, you better bet your bottom dollar. Three, recurrent ear infections. Absolutely. Recurrent ear infections can cause hearing loss. Four, use of nephrotoxic medications. No. What's nephro? Kidney. So <laughs> medications that harm your kidney, how's that gonna cause hearing loss? Absolutely not. Now, what you may have been thinking was autotoxic. If something's autotoxic, that can cause hearing loss, right? It messes with your ear, but not nephrotoxins. Nephro is kidneys, auto is ears, right? So number four is incorrect. Five, multiple piercings of the oracle. No, that doesn't cause hearing loss at all. Um, so the correct answer is one, two, and three. The client is diagnosed with acute otitis media. Which signs and symptoms support this medical diagnosis? One, unilateral pain in the ear. Two, green foul-smelling drainage. Three, sensation of congestion in the ear. Or four, reports of hearing loss. And guys, the correct answer is one, uni unilateral pain in the ear. So either on the left or right, they'll feel pain in the ear. That's the correct answer for otitis media. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. Two, green foul smelling drainage. Where do we see this? We see this in external otitis, okay? Choice three, sensation of congestion. What do I mean by congestion? Fluid, right? Sensation of congestion in the ear. Where do we see that? We see that in serous otitis media. When you see that word serous, I want you to think of that fluid, okay? Serous otitis media. Four, reports of hearing loss. Again, serous otitis media. The client diagnosed with chronic otitis media is scheduled for a mastoidectomy. Which discharge teaching should the nurse discuss with the client? One, instruct the client to blow the nose with the mouth closed. Two, explain that the client will never be able to hear from the ear. Three, instill ophthalmic drops in both ears and then insert a cotton ball. Four, do not allow water to enter the ear for six weeks. And guys, the correct answer is four, do not allow the water to enter um, the ear for six weeks weeks. So we don't want anything guys, we don't want the patient to, to do anything that will, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Submerge? Submerge? I'm looking for words. It's not coming to me, but we don't want that patient's ears to be underwater. We don't want to get water in the ear at all. Why? We don't want anything that could damage the uh, surgical site, right? 
and we don't want fluid to accumulate because what happens when fluid accumulates and is not moving? Bacteria grows and we don't want that patient to get a secondary infection. Okay, so uh, number four is the correct answer. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, instruct the client to blow the nose with the mouth closed. Absolutely not. What did I tell you earlier? We want them, if they have to blow the nose, they have to be with the mouth open. Why? We don't want them to have increased ocular pressure. We want that ocular pressure to be decreased. Two, explain that the client will never be able to hear from the ear. That's false. Um, they may have decreased hearing or they may even experience temporary deafness. But um, as that uh, swelling, that edema of the ear goes down, the hearing is going to come back. So that's false. Uh, three, instill ophthalmic drops in both ears and then insert a cotton ball. Insert a, co insert a cotton ball. Excuse me? Ophthalmic? Are we talking about the eyes? No, we're talking about the ears. What did I tell you the ears were? Optic, not ophthalmic, optic. So that's wrong. So the correct answer is four. The client is diagnosed with Meniere's disease. Which statement by the client supports that the client understands the medical management for this disease? One, after IV antibiotic therapy, I will be cured. Two, I will have to use a hearing aid for the rest of my life. Three, I must adhere to a low sodium diet, 2000 milligrams per day. Or four, I should sleep with the head of my bed elevated. Okay, guys, the correct answer is three. I must adhere to a low sodium diet, 2000 milligrams per day. So first of all, um, what causes Meniere's disease? Guys, um, what causes it is a buildup of fluid in the inner ear. So it only makes sense that that patient is going to be on a low sodium diet because what follows sodium? Fluid. If this disorder is caused by fluid accumulation, doesn't it make sense to decrease the sodium that we decrease the, the, the fluid? It only makes sense. So that's the correct answer. Okay. The patients with Meniere's disease, they're going to be on a low sodium diet. Why? We want to decrease that fluid. So there's decreased fluid accumulation. The client reports to the nurse that there's ringing in the ears. Which documentation would be most appropriate for the nurse to document in the client's chart? One, complaints of vertigo. Two, complaints of otorrhea. Three, complaints of tinnitus. Or four, complaints of presbycuspis. And guys, the correct answer is three, tinnitus. That's what it is, ringing of the ears. Now, let's look at our other terms. Let's look at our wrong choices. One, complaints of vertigo. Uh, vertigo is a feeling of dizziness someone gets with movement. Two, complaints of otorrhea. That's drainage of the ear. And four, complaints of presbycusis. Presbycusis, this is hearing loss. Excuse me, but this is hearing loss that's associated with aging. Okay, so the correct answer is tinnitus, which is ringing of the ear. The nurse is preparing to administer audit drops to, into a client's right ear. Which action should the nurse implement? One, grasp the ear lobe and pull back and out when pulling drops in the ear. Two, insert ear drops without touching the outside of the ear. Three, instruct the client to close the mouth and blow prior to installing drops, instilling drops. Or four, pour the oracle down and back prior to instilling drops. And guys, the correct answer is four. You want to pull the oracle down and back. Why? That strains the ear canal so the, medica so the medication can get through uh, to the tympanic membrane, which is the eardrum. Which autotoxic medication should the nurse administer cautiously? One, and, um, excuse me, one, an oral calcium channel blocker. Two, an IV aminoglycoside antibiotic. Three, an IV glucocorticoid. Or four, an oral loop diuretic. And guys, the correct answer is to an IV aminoglycoside antibiotic. Why? This is autotoxic. This medication, if too much is given and the patient gets a toxic level, it can cause deafness in the patient. The aminoglycoside is very important, okay? And guys, I can't believe it. We're already down to our last question. The client scheduled for ear surgery. Which statement indicates the client needs more preoperative teaching concerning the surgery? One, if I have to sneeze or blow my nose, I'll do it with my mouth open. Two, I may get dizzy after surgery, so I must be careful when walking. Three, I'll probably have some hearing loss after surgery, but hearing will return. Or four, 
I can shampoo my hair the day after surgery as long as I'm careful. And guys, the correct answer is four, I can shampoo my hair the day after surgery as long as I'm careful. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We don't want them um, shampooing. We don't want them showering. We don't want them swimming. We don't want them doing any, anything where they're immersing. That's the word I was looking for. I couldn't think of before. We don't want them doing anything immersing the ear where ear uh, uh, fluid can get inside of their um inside of the ear so that's the correct answer guys i hope you guys found this video helpful if there's anything in regards to vision or hearing that i didn't cover that you'd like to see me cover or maybe i did cover this content but you would like to see more of it please go ahead leave me a comment below and i'll make sure i'll add it to my list for you don't forget guys i'm on tiktok and instagram now and the content i have on tiktok is different than what i have here on youtube so it's going to be extra studying for you so make sure you get on tiktok and check me out next is nursing and one last thing i want to tell you guys um eventually i'm going to have things for the students who have graduated they're studying for nclex but for now i have material on my website nexus nursing institute i have ma material on my website for you if you're currently in the program Okay, right now I have a, I've got um, lots of fundies, lots of pharmacology, lots of OB, lots of peds, lots of GI, lots of respiratory, and every week I'm adding to it. So if you're in a nursing program right now, and whatever it is that you're learning, you're struggling, you need help, and you find me to be helpful, you find that the way I break things down, you understand it more, check out my content, Nexus Nursing Institute. I have lots of audio lessons for you to go through. Guys, thank you for sharing this time with me and I'll see you on my next video.